Hello and welcome to A Closer Look. I am Mark Miller. This is Mark Shine. Mark, league races are heating up. Rankings are out. We had some great games. We got some to highlight. Let's get going. You got Temple Christian. I have Temple Christian. They go and play at Allen East on Saturday night in our shootout type basketball game. Noel Howell for the Pioneers. He's got 31 points in the game, made seven three-point field goals. Seth Holbein had 12. He had a three-point field goal. Brody Bowman had a three-point field goal. They made 10 during the course of the game. That's the operator, our modus operandi now for the Pioneers, but not enough against a good Allen East basketball team. Spencer Miller had 30. He's averaging better than 20 a game now. Caleb Spence, Smelser had 18. He's averaging double figures as well. A 60-59 win for Allen East. Allen East now 6-3, 0-1 in the NWC. They came back from a loss against uh, Lincoln View on Friday night. Temple Christian is now 3-6. Their last four games have been losses by a total of 10 points. They can shoot the basketball, but just that far from winning. Well, you mentioned lots of threes. I'm going to tell oh, you about man. some more later on. I've got Kenton at Wapak. Wapak 66, Kenton 63 in overtime. It was 59 all in regulation for Wapak. Aaron Good hit a three at the buzzer to win the thing. He led him with 16 points. He had two threes off of the bench. Got lots of support, though. Gage Schenk, 11 points, five rebounds. Kyle Huffman, same thing, 11 and five. Jace Copeland, 11 points, six rebounds for Kenton. Thomas Phillips had 16 points and six rebounds. His twin brother, Hunter, had 13. Jaron Sharp, 13. Trent Heights, 13. This was a really good basketball game. Let's swing over to the MAC now. Let's look at St. Henry and Fort Recovery at Fort Recovery. Now, how about St. Henry, Mark? If you make 10 three-point field goals, your, your two best players, Ryan Lutmer, four for six. Tyler Schlarman, two for three. So they're shooting 67% from the three-point line. But as a team, they make 10 three-point field goals by five different players and they lost to Fort Recovery. Matt Vinn, he's got a big game. Caleb Martin has 12 plus six rebounds and assist and two blocks. Close basketball game all the way, but Fort Recovery, they win the third quarter 14-12. They win the fourth quarter 13-11. They win the basketball game, go to 2-0. Their only loss is in overtime for Fort Recovery. That was at Jay County. Good year going for the Fort Recovery Indians. On Friday night, Mark and I joined Jerry Snodgrass up at Liberty Benton. Van Buren at Liberty Benton, a matchup of two undefeated BVC teams. Liberty Benton, another overtime game, wins 63-58. Anthony Master Lasco had 46 points. Mark's going to have a lot, lot more to talk about later on concerning that young man. For Van Buren, Braxton Fasoni had 13 points but was in foul trouble most of the game. Saturday night, Wapak. Uh, ended up beating Liberty Benton, so they lost, and they're seven and three now. Van Buren came back with a good win at Patrick Henry. They are seven and one. All right, Mark, for our bright spot, we led into that thing. Yep. We had a lot of fun Friday night up there. Jerry uh, joins us once a year. This was the game he was with us. We had a great game, a lot of activity. That's going to be our bright spot. Let's talk about what happened at Liberty Benton Friday night. Well, Jerry Snodgrass, of course, the commissioner from the OHSAA, there was with the whole crew from Truck Two and. Ben and the guys, and Jerry, of course, on the right there. But he came down to do a game with us, and we had a great basketball game. First yeah. of all, that overtime game you mentioned a moment ago with Van Buren, but it also gave Jerry a chance to explain a lot of things that are going on with the OHSAA, his role, the new soccer thing that's coming out, the things he's doing with Military Night on January 20th. We're trying to get every school in the state who plays basketball on January 20th to celebrate the military in some way. Yeah. He spoke about a lot of great things. It was a great night. It was, and as you remember, he, was, he used to be uh, doing what Mark and I do. He was a broadcast partner of ours and Mike Shep going way back in the day. Prior to that, head basketball coach and athletic director at Findlay. He knows a lot of people across the state, but you put him near Findlay, we got back to Lima before he got out of that gym. At least that's yeah. what the crew told us. But what a great night. That's certainly a highlight of our year and a bright spot for sure. Wait, 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 wait. Do we have dinosaurs too? Oh. Don't we, we have there, was a, there was some T Rex sightings. Well, I know at we the, had dinosaurs. If not, right, well, there were some T Rex sightings there at the oh, game. Oh, yeah, a lot of three of them now, on. and yeah. my grandsons loved them, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, plays of the week, right. and you've got some good ones to I highlight do. that, Mr. We're, Master Lasco. Guy. We're going to go right back to that game that we saw a moment ago. The first thing is a backdoor cut. Watch Master Lasco set this up. Gets the pass from Frank Hart. Power Lab gets fouled inside. But this is something that Liberty Benton has done very well, going all the way back to the Steve Williman years. The fake high, you got to guard him out there on the line. He goes baseline. This is also a, a foul on Liberty Benton's yeah, big player Sony. inside yeah. for Sony's. That's a situation, too. Here's the thousandth point. Actually, it's point number 1,001. He gets a screen, does Master Lasco, splits the defense, and how many times did we see him over take the ball to the rim? Yeah. And then finally, in overtime, watch this move. 
fakes up, drop step, without a travel. What a tremendous baseline move. Just watch this again. This young man's going to go to Finley, and he just schooled the defense right there. And Anthony mm -hmm. Mastrolasco, what, he had 46 in this game, 23 in the loss to, to Wapak on Saturday night. That young man has a great future ahead of him in the college level, having a great year right now. With his 46, he broke the school single-game scoring record, as Mark mentioned, went over 1,001. Going in, we knew he needed 31 to get yep. there. We thought, ah, maybe not tonight. The next week, he blew it out of the water. Of course, the overtime period, what do you have? Double Thanks. figures Yeah, in double figures in overtime. So. Yeah, he was really good. All right, rule of the week. We're well, going to make him pull out his <laughs> official's whistle and talk about timeouts. Well, here's where this came from, Mark. Someone asked me, when does the timeout start? You know, I, I, a guy blows the whistle, okay, when does the timeout start? Well, here's the way we'll go through the whole situation involving timeouts. First of all, each team gets five a game. You get three 60-second timeouts. You get two 30-second timeouts. You get an additional timeout if you go into overtime for each overtime period. If you exceed that, the officials told call the foul, call it. It's a technical foul. The other team gets two shots and the ball if you exceed the number of timeouts. So. What are we looking for? When does the timeout start? Well, before the game, you'll notice the officials always go over and they talk to the two head coaches. Well, they're saying hi and good luck and all that, but they're also reminding the coach as soon as the timeout is called, let us know, is it a 30 or is it a full as soon as you do so, as soon as the timeout is called. If you don't, it's automatically a full timeout. Mm -hmm. That's why that takes place. So when does the timeout actually start? When both sets of players are in the vicinity of their bench, you'll see the official, the timeout was called by the coach. It was on this team over here and start the clock. And that's when your 30 seconds or a minute begins with 15 seconds remaining in that timeout, whether it's a 30 or a 60, the official scorekeeper blows the whistle or hits the horn mm -hmm. and you got 15 seconds back on the floor and ready to play. The only other addition to that is if both teams are on the floor and ready to play, the timeout can end anytime in that 60 seconds or 30 seconds, as long as both teams are on the floor and ready to play. Who can call timeout? Well, that's one of the areas of contention, isn't it? Because of several years ago, we let coaches start calling timeout. They can do that. Any head coach can call timeout. In fact, that's one of the issues because you hear somebody behind you yelling timeout. You got to leave the floor and look behind you to make sure it's the coach and not just a fan or an assistant coach or something like that. Also, players can call it on the floor as well. No assistant coaches, no assistant players Assistant coaches, the bench. nobody on the bench, and not that guy sitting in the third row who thinks he knows more than the coach does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good job. Hey, yep. we have a lot of fun researching and finding out yep. uh, where are they now. Former players and coaches from our area that maybe we covered, and yep. what are they doing? We enjoyed them so much. Mark tonight has Eric and Tim Pollitz from Ottawa Glendale. You know what, Mark, we talked about, we'd usually just do a single player. You yeah. can't, separate can't separate Tim and Eric Pollitz. Yeah. They came on the scene as freshmen. They have played at Ottawa Glendor for four years. Their team won the Western Buckeye League all four years they were in school there, accumulating in the 2004 year when they won a state championship. Well, Tim is uh, Ottawa Glendorf and Putnam County's leading scorer, at least he was when he graduated, with 1,672 career points. He averaged 21.4 as a senior with second team All-State. Eric was also second team All-State as a senior. He had 1,222 career points, averaged 18.8 .8 as a senior. And again, they were state champions. We saw him play against LeBron a couple times and couldn't get yeah. past him. Yeah. And then LeBron moved on, of course, to do bigger and better things. And they won the state championship. Uh, in 2004. So what happened? They both go off to Miami University. Tim played all four years and during those four years they made postseason play. All four years he was at Miami University. Three-time All-Mac selection. Graduated in 2008. Eric had an injury. Red shirt of the year. He graduated a year later. They both have degrees in sports management and sports studies and they've gone on to other things now because Tim is now married. He married a Miami grad, Meredith Cress. They live in uh, Greenville, Ohio. He works for Miami Valley Youth for Christ of Dark County. They have uh, three children. Raylan is five, Jonah is three, Nathan is one, and Meredith works as a speech therapist in the Greenville school system. Eric also went on, he got a master's degree this time from Southern Baptist Seminary. He works for Parkside Church. Uh, it's near Chagrin Falls. Uh, he works with uh, students in college area and adult ministry of young adult ministry. They live in Streetsboro. He married, uh, also a Miami grad, Emily Grease, and they have an infant daughter, brand new, Lucy Jane. And you know the thing I liked about them? Every year they got better at some facet of the game. And by the time they were seniors, they were dominant players. These were big, strong guys that could run the floor, play inside, outside. They also played soccer and tennis. Can you imagine Can you, that, those you guys know, on a net? You we, know, with the, wouldn't you like to be a doubles team with those two guys? Oh, Just, man. 
I was just always glad that they didn't play football. <laughs> yeah, that's right. My kids played football. Yeah, <laughs> right. All right, good job. Hey, hey let's we, preview. We ought to thank Tom Giesken. My fault. Tom got us a Tom, a longtime FCA board member here, a good friend of ours from Ottawa Glendorf. He got us a lot of the information. Thanks, Tom. Okay, All right. Sorry. Hey, time to preview games that are All coming right. up. And I'll start off. Elida at Wapak. This is the game of the week in the WBL. They're both 2-0 and in the league. Wapak having a great year, 9-1. and Elida 5-4, and but they've played a good schedule. And as you'll see soon, they played a great game on Saturday night, even though they lost. On Friday night, they beat Defiance in the league, 62-36. Then they went to an undefeated team at Worcester, played at the College of Worcester. They lost in close fashion, 69-67. Had a, a desperation three at the buzzer, did not go in. Daniel Unruh has been their leading scorer right around 20 every game. He can score inside, outside, but he's starting to get some scoring help. Drew Sarno's consistent. Isaac McAdams consistent. Skylar Smith puts in threes. And so they've kind of got it rolling right now. And so they're going to go down to Wapak, who beat Kenton on Friday night. Another overtime, 63-66. Yeah. And then on Saturday night, they beat the Liberty Benton team that we talked about, 51-44. Aaron Good led him in scoring both games this, this weekend, but they have really balanced scoring. They had four guys in double figures in that game against Kenton, so this should be a really nice WBL game. Well, you are right. This is the big game, but if you're trying to hang in the race, our next game is also equally important in Western Buckeye League. That's Van Wert. They're 1-1. One and one. Shawnee is 1-1. One and one. The loser of this game most probably is going to fall out of the race, particularly with the well those two teams are playing and with Ottawa Glendorf. Van Wert, a little bit of a surprise team this year. They averaged 58.6 points per game. They beat St. Mary's in overtime the other night. Um, they, they give up 53.9. Their losses, here's the real key for them. When they defend, okay, when they, excuse me, when they score, they score 61.5 when they win. When they lose, they give up 47, score 47.8. They've got to score points. Jacob Kelly averages plus 19. Uh, Nate Place averages about 13. Shawnee, we've had them before. Sean McDonald's having an outstanding year, averaging 19.5 points per game. Uh, he scores a 19 three-point field goal so far this season in their 10 games. They've got seven or eight other guys who consistently can score for them. Here's the big thing for Shawnee. This will be their seventh home game of the year. They only play four out of their last 10 games at home. And in the WBL, the only two home games they have left after this week are Elida and Salina. They're going to go on the road to the Western Buckeye League schedule. This is a huge game for both teams, but especially for Shawnee in that schedule. Yep. Want to win at home. Yep. All right, let's go to the MAC Conference. Marion Local, 6-2, and 2-0 in the conference at Versailles. They are 9-1, 3-0. Their only loss, Dayton Dunbar. We all know what kind of program they have down there. Marion Local beat New Bremen big on Friday, came back and beats Anna on Saturday by 3, 63-60. Tyler Mesher, the football kid, is their leading scorer and rebounder. They have Van Wert Saturday night after this, so a tough weekend for the Flyers. Versailles, they beat Parkway uh, by a bunch. Justin Arns had 29 points. That's kind of a common scoring night for mm -hmm. him. He's having a great year. They beat Franklin Monroe very comfortably on Saturday. They are in the midst of a four-game win streak. Versailles, number seven in Division Three, Fort Lormy, number one in Division Four. They play a game, Fort Lormy and Versailles tonight. Versailles eight and one, or Fort yeah. Lormy's eight and one. That'll be a tough midweek game, and then get ready for the Flyers on Friday night. Absolutely, that's a huge game, but of course, one's kind of fun to play because it's non-conference as well. Let's shift over to the uh, the Putnam County League and talk about a couple of coaches who are really preaching defense. Joe Bradick's team is four and two overall. They're two and one in the PCL at Put, uh, Pandora Gilbo, but they give up just 42 points a game. Uh, no one has scored more than 45 or since they got past their first game and lost to Allen East to get 54. Nobody else has scored more than 45 against them. They have a great player in Drew, Drew Johnson averaging 18.7. They have a big BBC game up against Lipsick on Friday night we'll get mm -hmm. to in just a moment mm -hmm. before this game takes place on Saturday night. Ottoville and Todd Turnwell, they're 7-3, 1-0 in the PCL. They only give up 50 points a game. In the last five games, they've given up just 44 points a game. So two strong defensive teams. Logan Kemp, Kemper at 19.3. Nick Mormon at 16.4. Two good scores for them. This will be a real interesting PCL game on Saturday night. All right, and that Friday night game that you alluded yep. to, a BVC game. Lipsick 6-3, 4-0 in the BVC. At Pandora Gilboa, they're also undefeated 2-0 in the BVC. Lipsick last week, a game that Mark and I did, beat Continental, another overtime game. Yeah. On Saturday, they beat Arcadia. Now, here's the good news for Lipsick. On, on Friday night, we saw Grant Schrader, their leading scorer, go out with an injury and not play anymore in yeah. that game. He came back and scored 13 on Saturday night. I'm assuming he's healthy, and that's good news. Pandora Gilboa, you mentioned they beat Arlington on Friday night. 
another overtime game. 11 <laughs> guys scored yeah. in that game. That's depth. Right. And then they lost a very close game by one point to Miller City. So uh, th this is a rematch, you know, and I learned something here tonight. BBC game this time, they're also in the PCL. They played a few weeks ago, December 29, Lipsick lost 43-50 to to PG. So All this right. is a rematch. And one more big game that we kind of like because it's a yeah. great non-conference game. In fact, we get to telecast this yeah. one. This is Finley at Ottawa Glendorf on Saturday night. The Trojans are 5-3. and three. They're 3-1 three and one in the track going into Tuesday night's game with Toledo Central Catholic. And then they also play Toledo St. John's, who's really good at St. John's on Friday night. So a big week coming up uh, for Finley. They average 62 points a game. They give up 52. Kyle Nunn leads them in scoring at 15.3. Drew Happner at 14.5. And they have three guys that can shoot three-point field goals on top of that. That's Finley. We know about Ottawa Glandorf. They defeated LCC on Monday, 68-54, coming off three games in four days. They're led, of course, by Jay Kaufman. He's averaging better than 20. Jay Dybel at 12 points a game. Owen Heigl uh, at 18 points a game, or at eight points a game. Schroeder's their three-point shooter. They're at Salina on Friday night. Finley won the game last year in overtime. OG the year before that by eight. This will be a great matchup yep. on Saturday night. Can't wait to do it. Yes, sir. A lot of good games up on the screen. You'll see the ones that the station is doing. Uh, some girls games, again, wrestling in there. Boy, it's just a very busy time of year. And the crews around here are working feverishly to bring you the great ones. We will be a part of that also, as Mark mentioned. Hope to see you at the gym. Hope to see you back here again next week on A Closer Look. Good night, everyone.